Good morning and welcome to Community Bible Church. We're going to invite you to stand as we begin our time of worship.
Good morning. Welcome to Community Bible Church. We're so glad that you're here with us today. I'd ask you to pick up one of our bulletins. It's got lots of helpful information about different things going on in church. We would also ask you to fill out the Connect card on the side. Just tear that off, fill it out, and leave it on your pew. It's how you can let us know that you are here this morning. You can also update your information and share prayer requests with us that way. There's also a place to sign up for events that we have coming up. Thanks again for being here with us this morning. Have a great day. I am very excited about our worship service prayer team that we're getting together. I'm out here in the breezeway. Here is the sign-up sheet right here. We've already got five or six people signed up, and we like we need a lot more. And we like for we're asking people to take just one Sunday a month, you know, and just just one of the two services and to pray during that time. For everything going on in the service, for hurting people who are coming, for people who are there in the congregation, for the for the worship, for the for the singing, for the uh, prayer that people come forward, for the messages, of course, and we just are excited about what a spiritual impact this is going to have. So I really encourage you to get out here and let's fill up this sheet today and see uh, how many people we can get on this prayer team. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Leger, and I am the flight leader here at Community Bible Church. Flight is our ministry here for preteens, fifth, sixth, seventh graders. We meet during worship at 1030, and then once that's done, we get, o- get over to the Family Life Center for our own lesson. What we're looking for are teachers or assistants who want to join us. If you have a good heart, you have the gift of teaching, or if you just love being around three teens. If you're interested in helping out, check the flight box on the Connect card. Are you new to Community Bible Church? Or maybe you've been here for a while and have never taken that step to become a member. Well, Class 101 is for you. This is our class to find out all about who we are as a church, what we believe, and why we do some of the things that we do. This is going to be on Sunday, September 8th, from 3 to 6 o'clock in the afternoon. You can sign up on your Connect card. We hope to see you there. Hi, my name is Luke Newman. And one thing that a leader here in the CBC Youth Ministry has taught me is how to truly live out my life for Christ. And one other thing that I've learned throughout all the leaders is not, to not always focus on the negative in life, but always focus on the positive. Hi, I'm Carter Laval. It's something that leaders in the youth group really need to understand, not only more of the bad, but also the importance of helping others to learn more about what they read, and about the importance of living it out in your own life. So if you've ever been interested in volunteering, or even a parent of a youth age child, we encourage you to attend this free training. It will be Saturday, September 21st from 9 to 11.30 a.m. There is a sign-up sheet on the ministry wall. We hope to see you there, and here's a sneak peek of what you have to look forward to. The most important thing you bring to a youth ministry, that you bring to a teenager, that you bring to a parent, it's not your biblical knowledge. It's not your vibrant charisma or your wise teaching, and it's definitely not your coolness factor. And to be perfectly honest, I actually don't think it matters if you're cool, because teenagers don't care if you're cool as long as they know that you care. Right now is the best time for you to sign up for a life group. Life groups are our groups that meet during the week at different times. What does it mean to be part of a life group? Well, here's our friends from the Skit Guys to let you know more. Hi, I'm Tommy. And I'm Eddie. And we're the Skit Guys. We want to encourage you to sign up for community groups. Uh, I think it means Sunday school classes. Well, some may call them that, but they're really just small groups that meet. That is true. Mm-hmm. That is true. I heard of a church one time that called them life groups. Oh, oh um, I have a friend that calls them connect groups. Well, my aunt's church actually calls them cell groups. Okay, okay. My my brother's cousin, once removed, no, no, twice removed, he calls them growth groups. Well, I heard that the guy who invented Toaster Strudel, his church calls them family groups. Oh, yeah? Well, I was watching YouTube once, and this, um, this dachshund is barking, and the dog that was barking made the sound, and the sound that it made sounded like the dog was saying home groups. No. 
Yes. No. Yes. Show me what it was like. Anyway, no matter what you call it, sign up. Yeah, there's nothing better than being a part of a community and doing life together at church. How many churches call these groups food groups? I don't know. If I was in a food group, I'd want to be in chocolate. <laughs> yeah, and these aren't all Sunday school classes. At the table out of the lobby, we've got all of the information about what we call life groups. There are groups for men, groups for women, as well as groups that are mixed. We've got groups that meet in the mornings and the evenings. If you live anywhere from North LaRose to Raceland, there's a group that's going to be starting out in the central Lafouche area, so I encourage you to check that one out. There are lots of other opportunities as well, so there's no reason for you to not get plugged in to a life group. So check out that table and sign up for one today. Thanks. his heart out for 30 years in service to our ministry. Pastor Bill has announced his retirement in May of 2020. And he and Miss Julie will uh, ride off into the sunset of the western sky Saturday night in Death Valley. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Sean, I had a flashback. The board convened a committee, a search committee, which was ratified by you as a congregation, as our bylaws state, to uh, seek out our next senior pastor. The committee put out a job description on the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary in Dallas Theological Seminary, and we received resumes, and we went through the resumes, and we chose our top candidate. We had that candidate come in on two separate occasions with an, for an interview, and a face-to-face -face, uh, dialogue with the committee. After a lot of prayer, a lot of deliberation and communication, and fasting, <laughs> the committee made its decision and voted unanimously on its top choice. Last Wednesday night, the Board of Elders met. The candidate again appeared and answered questions, and there was a long dialogue that occurred as far as vision and we both sought out what each other was looking for in the ministry. And after this uh, meeting uh, was uh, adjourned, the board voted by individual vote, but did vote unanimously to recommend to the congregation that our next pastor be Matt Dickinson. <laughs> as to the procedure to, um, to uh, name a new pastor. The next event that will occur is September 15th. Matt will preach a message here and will be available to everybody between services and during after the service. So those of you who maybe are not really familiar with him or haven't uh, gotten to meet him hand, uh, face to face, you'll be here available to meet and greet on the 15th. Then again, as our bylaws state, there will be a vote of the congregation two weeks after that, September 29th. Members of the church will receive an announcement in the mail of these events, which will also contain a ballot. You're to bring that ballot with you when you come to the meeting on September 29th. There will be a vote at that time, and the results will be announced at that time. So once again, Matt Johanna, welcome aboard. Let's stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for uh, for Matt and Joanne and Joanna answering the call, Father, and we just pray, Lord, as as we continue to go through the process of um, of hiring him on as our pastor, that you would continue to lead us and guide us through this entire process, um, that your will and your will alone would be honored throughout this entire thing, God. So, Father, we just thank you for that, Father. We lift up our, our services to you this morning, um, that they would be honoring and glorifying to you, Father. And 
And as, um, as the month of September begins as, um, as Child Cancer Awareness Month, uh, and we've had so many in our community and in our congregation that has, um, has suffered through this and, and is continuing to fight right now. So we just lift up those in our church and in our community, the little ones that are, are fighting with cancer, Father, that you would just um, give them and their family strength through this time and father we pray for uh, ultimately your healing in each and every one of their lives god so father we continue to lift you up and worship you our powerful mighty god amen, amen.
Celebrate communion. How great it is it that Matt is by us. Matt, we could not be happier. Just this is God's deal, and we're so excited about that. Would the ushers please come forward and prepare for the communion uh, to be presented? On November the 26th, 2008, a gang of terrorists stormed the Taj Mahal Palace in Mumbai, India, and after uh, they, they came in, after the carnage they had left, they had left 200 people dead. And a reporter interviewed a guest who had been there in the hotel at that uh, dinner that night, and the guest described for the reporter how he and his friends were miraculously spared. They had been eating dinner, they, they heard the gunshots, and someone just grabbed them and pulled them under the table. Then the assassins just came striding through the restaurant, shooting at will, killing everyone in the room, or so they thought. Miraculously, the man survived, and when the interviewer asked the guest how he lived when everyone else in that room died, he replied, I suppose it was because I was covered in someone else's blood, and they took me for dead. What a beautiful picture of God's gift through Jesus Christ to each one of us, because you see, we are covered in someone else's blood. Because he paid for the penalty of our sin, because we are covered in the blood of his sacrifice for us, we are able to live and not die. We are able to have eternal life. So this morning, as you're receiving communion, think about that. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance.
we come before you and we, we thank you for this time of celebrating our freedom, our liberty found in you. Father, I thank you that we can come with excitement and joy as we sing about your freedom, but as well come and just contemplate on what that freedom means for us. So, Father, we come before you this morning humbled that you would choose us, God, that you would send your son to die on the cross for our sins, and that we would have freedom through that sacrifice. So I pray that we would never take that for granted and that we would always remember the price that was paid. So, Father, we come before you this morning just with humble hearts, worshiping you for who you are, our Savior, our God. Amen. Well, what would you do if you won the lottery? Imagine all of us have thought about that from now, now and then. But, you know, the, the odds are incredibly slim that you'd ever win. In fact, it, your odds of getting struck by lightning are greater than winning the lottery. But in June of this year, Charles Jackson, a 66-year-old grandfather from North Carolina, won the $344.6 million Powerball prize. Now, most lottery winners, of course, go out and, and with their winnings, they buy expensive cars and big, beautiful new homes and all kinds of things for themselves and their family. And surprisingly, you've read the stories, most winners end up being losers. And a lot of them just run right through their money and don't have a penny left, and they end up living pretty miserable lives. But I wonder, I wonder how we would live our lives if we won the lottery. I know all of you would give 10% to church. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But the truth is, maybe none of us have ever won a lottery before, but you and I are already big time winners. We are rich just from the fact that we are alive. That we've given, we've been given this gift of life, and we're living and breathing and thinking, and and we are rich just because we can laugh and, and work and enjoy life. We are spiritually rich because we have a relationship with God through His Son Jesus Christ, and He loves us and He provides for us, He takes care of us, and we have this church. This wonderful church where we can freely worship God and we can learn from his word and enjoy fellowship with each other. We are incredibly rich. And we are actually financially rich as well because we do happen to live in the most blessed, the most prosperous country that has ever existed in the history of the world. And by the standards of the world, as Robert shared last week, nearly every one of us, we are incredibly wealthy. Here's the question. Here's the question. What will we do with our winnings? How will we choose to live out this amazing life that God has given us? Well, this morning, Jesus tells us how every single one of us can live a really great life. In fact, he's going to show us how to live the very best life possible in this fallen world of ours. And what Jesus tells us is that the best way to live out our lives is to live as a servant. In fact, I think, you know, I have a hunch that if Jesus walked in here this morning and we asked him, how, how can we have a really great life? I think he would tell us that the life of a servant, yes, it is not easy, but it provides more joy, more sin satisfaction, more, more eternal significance than any winning lottery ticket ever could. So if you got your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 10, and there we're going to learn this morning about being a servant of God. Why don't we, why don't we begin with prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings that you've showered on us. And Father, we know that many of us are actually struggling today with various difficulties and challenges and uh, bad things that have happened to us. But Lord, I just pray that you would be their encouragement. And Father, I pray that, that you would help us to live a life that is pleasing to you. Lord, that you would use this passage and from your word to just inspire us to, to want to be servants. Servants of you. 
For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the first thing we see in verses 32 to 34 is the sacrifice of being a servant of God. The sacrifice of being a servant. Verse 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise to life. Jesus is on a death march. He's on a march to Jerusalem where he would be rejected, mocked, humiliated, tortured, and crucified. Jesus had walked to Jerusalem with disciples many times before, but this particular, there's something real different. Something real different going on with Jesus. Because I think they see that Jesus is resolute. That he is determined that nothing, <coughs> nothing will stop him on his march to the cross. And he is deadly serious. Probably not a whole lot of chit-chat going on with the disciples on this particular walk. No, he has a laser focus on what lies ahead of him. Something which is far worse than you and I will ever be able to comprehend. And sensing the foreboding seriousness of all of this, the disciples, his followers, they're just astonished. That they're scared. They don't want to think about this. So then Jesus gathers his 12 disciples around him and tells them for the third time, and he counted them in the gospel, one, two, three, Mark 8, Mark 9, here's some 10. He tells them what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. But this time, he gives far more detail than he's ever shared before. And just look at the, the violent words that he shares them. Condemn, hand over, mock, spit, flog, kill. Jesus at the suffering servant of God, which was prophesied to happen in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and other Old Testament passages. He is getting ready to sacrifice his life for them. And listen, he's getting ready to sacrifice his life for us. And he's letting them and he's letting us know that being a servant of God, it requires sacrifice. The road to glory goes through the path of suffering and sacrifice. And as twice before, the disciples just don't get it. The term suffering Messiah was an oxymoron to them, that they just couldn't put those two words together and make any sense out of it at all. And we see very clearly they don't get it by what happens very next in verses 35 to 41. Then, which means right after that, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can. They answered, and Jesus said, you will, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with, but to sit at my right and left hand is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. And when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Now in these particular verses, we're able to see the struggles of being a servant of God. It's not easy. It's a struggle for us to be servants of God. And guys, just again, the juxtaposition here of Jesus' utter humility right alongside the disciples' ugly pride is just breathtaking. Jesus had just spilled his guts with him and shared with him from the bottom of his heart the horrors that he was getting ready to endure as he sacrificed himself for them. And the very next thing, James and John are making this self-serving grab for power in an effort to elevate themselves above everybody else. Here's Jesus. He's just given them. He's just talked about all that he was about to give. James and John callously walk up to him and present him with a shopping list of all they want to get. 
see in this passage, we can see two very different paths to greatness. On one, the one hand, there's the path of self-promotion. Now, on the other hand, there's the path of self-denial. Self-promotion, that's the world's way. <laughs> self-denial, that's God's way. And it's very clear from this passage that James and John have totally bought into the world's way to greatness. They are promoting themselves like crazy. Now, aren't you glad reading? Isn't it just great reading this that, that we know that none of us ever act like that? I mean, we never want to put ourselves first for crying out. We, we don't do that kind of thing. I mean, we never want to be smarter or prettier or more talented or more successful or richer than other people we know who seem to have made. We are always just thrilled when the other guy gets the promotion, when the other guy gets the raise and the praise and the admiration of people instead of us, right? Not exactly. No, the truth is, like James and John, it's a struggle, guys. It's a real struggle for you and me to be servants of God. The truth is, sometimes we are just like James and John. The truth is, sometimes looking at James and John is like looking in the mirror. We see them in our own selfishness and pride. You see, for James and John and for us, our pride pushes us to promote number one, to promote ourselves. But when we do, it causes a lot of collateral damage. First of all, selfish ambition raises its ugly head. James and John, right after Jesus tells them of his impending death, James and John just kind of come sidling up to Jesus and say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. It's like a little child. He said, Mommy, Daddy, would you do whatever I ask you uh, to do? Well, no parents could say, of course, whatever. No. In other words, they're saying, look, Jesus, we've got this blank check here. Uh, would you mind just signing your name at the bottom so, so we, can, we can cash it in? Of course. Jesus doesn't fall for that shameless little trick. And he asks them what it is that they want him to do for them. And they say, let one of us sit at your right and other on your left in your glory. Okay, this is self-ambition on steroids. It's unbelievable. Matthew 19, 28. Jesus had already promised the 12 apostles that in his kingdom they would sit on 12 thrones with him in the kingdom. Well, that wasn't enough. Oh, no, that wasn't enough. They wanted the two places that would be the highest power, the highest of power, power the highest everything. They wanted to be above the other 10 disciples. They wanted to be number one, number two, right behind Jesus. Well, selfish ambition can just wreak havoc in the church today. And as you read some, some headlines, you see this happening uh, all the time. As John Stott says in his book, The Cross of Christ, an excellent book, he says this, Our world and even the church is full of Jameses and Johns, go-getters and status seekers, hungry for honor and prestige, measuring life by achievements and everlastingly dreaming of success. Commentator Dave Garland goes on to say, One need not look far to see preachers who do not preach to reach people, but preach to reach the top, to become church superstars. They want rank and privilege. Like James and John, they, they assume that Jesus is someone who will achieve things for them and give them the status of lords. To this outrageous request, Jesus replies, You don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Now, cup here it is a Jewish metaphor for the wrath of God, which is poured out in judgment on against human sin. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is praying to the Father, and Jesus is coming, he's actually bleeding drops of blood or sweating drops of blood. And, and he asked Jesus, asked God, God, please let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way, God, let me not have to go to the cross. Let me not have to, to drink this cup of your terrifying judgments. To be baptized or being under the water is just a way of expressing being overwhelmed by calamity. And so here, the baptism of Jesus was him being overwhelmed by the prospect of the suffering that's involved in taking on 
all of God's righteous judgment and all the sins of mankind. So Jesus is saying to James and John, you want all this glory and recognition and position? Do you have any idea the kind of pain, the kind of suffering I'm going to have to go through? Do, do you really think you can suffer the way I'm getting ready to suffer? And their pride leads them to the second ugly consequence, which is arrogant self-confidence. Arrogant self-confidence. Jesus asks them if they can suffer like he's going to have to suffer, and these two bozos say, yeah, we can. No problem. We got this. Of course they couldn't. The second Jesus is arrested in the garden, man, whoo, they take off running. Off to hide in the darkness. They desert Jesus so much for being able to handle a little suffering. Verse 41 says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. You see, the other ten disciples hear about James and John's power grab, you know, this power play to have the best seats in the house, and they are ticked off Probably because they hadn't thought about it first. How do we think of that? Third consequence of pride and self-promotion is ugly competition with others. You know, you see that. You know, the, the, they start getting arguments. Oh, you're the greatest. I'm the greatest. You can't be first. I want to be your brother. And it just destroys unity in, in that little fellowship of believers. Well, self-promotion resulting from pride is damaging and it is dangerous. As we've seen, it leads to audacious self-ambition instead of seeking to do God's will. As we've seen, it leads to arrogant self-confidence instead of humble dependence on God. As we've seen, it leads to ugly competitiveness in the church instead of having love for one another. Being a servant of God is by far the best way to live, but it is not easy. It's hard, guys. It's hard. Because it just goes completely against the grain of our own sinful natures, and it goes completely against the grain of everything that the world stands for. So what does Jesus do? Calls a timeout. Calls a timeout. Brings all the disciples in a little huddle on the sideline there, and he gives them a much needed lesson, again, on being a servant of God. Verses 42 to 45, Jesus shares on how to be a servant of God. Well, the first thing Jesus tells them is that our model is not the world around us. Verse 42, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those in the world who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. And truth though, people in our lost world are just driven by selfish ambition. What do they want? They want to dominate. They want to exercise control over other people. That's just the way it is in the world. And in the world, the more important you are, the more people there are who are serving you. I was talking to somebody not too long ago. He was telling me about a, a person uh, in another city who was, who was doing really well in his job. And with great admiration, almost a reverential tone, he said to me, you know, he's over 500 people. 500 people report directly to him. And that's what people want. Hey, let's face it, sometimes that's what we want, isn't it? They want to be the one that's on the top. They want to be the one who's telling everybody else what they need to do. And that's the measure of success in the world. The world is not so impressed if you happen to be one of those measly little 500 who have to report to their superior. In the world, the more important you are, the more people there are who are serving you. But Jesus says to his followers, uh-uh, no, nope, no, that's not it. Not you. If you're a follower, that's not what you do if you're a follower of me. In his world, you see, in his kingdom, the more important you are, the more people you serve. Do you hear that? Importance in God's kingdom is determined not by how many people serve you, but how you serve others. And Jesus teaches them that greatness is achieved not through promoting yourself, but by denying yourself. Not promoting, 
Woo, look at me. Yeah, push myself to the top. But by denying yourself. Verse 43. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first must be the slave of all. So greatness then in God's economy is achieved by being a servant. And the word there is diakonos. That's where we get our word deacon from. And diakonos uh, in the New Testament, it, it, it has been used as signifying a table waiter, someone who waits on tables, or one who voluntarily renders useful service to other people. You know, one thing I love about this church is that you people are full. You know, this church is full of servants. There's so many servants out there, I just look at, look around and just smile at all you people who are just giving of yourself to others. Let me give you one example. Like I can list 20, but let me just say something happened just this past Saturday morning. Saturday morning, 7 o'clock a.m., Roe and Maureen P. and Brent Savoy were all here at church all morning pressure washing the agape house. Nobody asked them to come. This is not an official work day. They just saw a need. The agape house was dirty on the outside, and it needed a bath, so they came out and washed it. God, that's being a servant. Not only that, Jesus says that being first involves being a slave, a doula slave, one who forfeits his own rights to serve others. Now, slaves in the first century were even lower than servants. Servants did a job uh, for somebody, but they had freedom and independence. Slaves were owned totally by their master. They would do whatever the master asked. They would go wherever the master asked them to go without question, without hesitation. Then in verse 45, we see that the supreme model of being a servant is none other than Jesus himself. You know, this whole year we've been talking about serving God. That's been our theme. And really, the climax of that theme in the Gospel of Mark is right here in this very verse. For the Son, for even the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for me. For even the Son of Man, again, Son of Man, that, that's one of the names in Scripture for the Messiah, the Christ. And we, just never, we must never forget that this Jesus we read about in the Gospels, this Jesus was God. He actually created all the universe and everything in it. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. There's no beginning, no end with him. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And even he came to serve, not to be served. I just had a hard time learning about this whole business of being a servant of God. You know, just before uh, they're about to have a Passover meal with Jesus, you know, the disciples had all sat down around the table and reclined at the table. And, but the servant boy, whose job was to wash everyone's feet before such an important meal, was nowhere to be found. Maybe he's off having his own Passover meal. We don't know. So no one had their feet washed when they came in. And before the meal began, the disciples were having without a doubt, their favorite discussion. Which one of them is the greatest of all? Peter's over there saying, look, I was the first one to figure out who Jesus was. Remember Caesarea Philippi? Jesus says, who do men say that I am? I say, you are the Christ. I, just, I figured that out. You guys didn't. Hey, I'm the guy that walked on water. Just for a few steps, but I walked on water. You guys, y'all stayed in the boat. I am the greatest by far. And Andrew said, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, I'm the one who found Jesus. I'm the one who brought you to Jesus. Besides, you've got foot-in-the-mouth disease. You're always saying the craziest, weirdest things. I'm the greatest, not you. And the Zebedee boys, James and John, you know, they chime in. Listen, we're the sons of thunder. We're powerful. We get people's attention. We're loud. We get things done. And there's two of us. And as they were all taking turns, you know, busy tooting their own horns, suddenly one of the disciples happened to glance over in the corner and see somebody uh, taking off his outer garment and kneeling down. It was Jesus. He had a towel wrapped around him, and he was pouring water into a basin. 
Now think about this. The Son of God. Here he is acting like a servant. He had told them again and again and again about the importance of being a servant, and it just never seemed to sink in. So here, the night before he was crucified, they were still arguing about who is the greatest. So this time, Jesus decided to teach the lesson once again, but this time not through words so much as through an action. He washed their feet. He, the Son of God, went around from one proud disciple to the next, to the next, to the next, washing their dirty, smelly, calloused, and cracking feet. John 13, 12 to 17 says, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've just done for you? He asked them. <coughs> You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And just to make sure they had missed it, I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Because this is what Jesus is calling you and me to do. He's calling us not to be served, but to serve. Years ago, Howard Hendricks was speaking uh, at Fourth Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. He was speaking there at a 6.30 uh, in the morning father-son breakfast. And Hendricks uh, later recalls, There were many people from the military there, quite a few people from various government offices, some craftsmen, laborers of various kinds, really quite a mix. After I'd finished speaking and the meeting was dismissed, I looked over to my right, and there was Senator Mark Hatfield, stacking chairs and picking up napkins that had fallen on the floor. Dr. Hendricks says, Ladies and gentlemen, if you are impressed that you are a United States senator, you don't stack chairs and pick up napkins. If you are impressed that you are God's gift to the body of Christ as the great preacher of this age, you don't stoop to serve. If you are impressed that really you are the greatest thing that ever happened to your local church, you don't serve, you are living to be served. At the end of Mark 10, 45, Jesus went on to tell the disciples the greatest act of service that he would ever do for mankind. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom he gave his life as a ransom. Jesus has told his disciples before that he was going to die, but never before in the gospel arc had he ever told them why he had to die. But he does right here. He said he gave his life as a ransom. Ransom, the Greek word is lutron. It means the price of release. It's a payment to release slaves or captives from bondage. Well, we need a ransom because every single one of us, every single one of us, guys, we're in bondage as slaves of sin. And when Jesus paid the ransom, when he died on the cross for us in our place, taking the punishment that we deserve for our sins, our slave masters, sin and death and hell and Satan, they had to set us free. They had no choice. They were forced to set us free. Free. That's the heart of the gospel, guys. That's what it's all about. This is why Jesus came. And if he didn't come, if he didn't pay that ransom price, we'd all still be stuck in our sins. We'd all be lost. We'd all have a one-way ticket straight to hell. So how do we respond to that? How do we respond to Jesus who gave his life as a ransom for us? Well, here's how. We just give our lives back to Him. We, we become like Him. We become humble servants of God. So the question is, how is God calling you to serve? Well, make no mistake about it. If you're a believer, He definitely wants you to serve. 1 Peter 4.10, a New Living Translation says, God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Hear that? Use them well. 
to serve one another. Well, how is God calling you to serve? Well, it may be that God is calling you to serve in your neighborhood. Did you know, this is fascinating, did you know that Jesus lives in your neighborhood? He does. He really does. You see, Jesus is the last key kid who, who just needs somebody after school to maybe shoot a few hoops or, or play catch. In your neighborhood, Jesus is the elderly widow who's just dying of loneliness. Jesus is that young couple in your neighborhood who are just struggling in their marriage. They're not really sure if they're going to make it. And that couple would give anything if an older, more mature couple would just come alongside them and mentor them and encourage them to hang in there. See, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. I'm telling you, Jesus is in your neighborhood, and he's waiting for you to reach out and serve. You know, there are all kinds of ways to serve. There are all kinds of ways to serve right here at our church. Uh, Katina, would you stand up? Katina is serving can the fight for cancer. She's, going, she's wearing a cape. She's bringing, she's doing whatever she can. This is her passion. She's had a grandchild who's gone through cancer, and she is doing as a servant of God, trying to help bring awareness to that. That's a great way to serve. Right here in the church, you can, you can get in a life group and serve others. Did you hear that? Getting a life group, I cannot encourage you enough. Every one of us needs to be in some kind of life group. But you know, it's not about you. You ever thought about that you need to be in a life group so that you can serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a big part of it. You can serve in Awana or as a Sunday school teacher or as a youth group leader. You can serve in the food pantry. You can serve in Celebrate Recovery. You can serve filling a Christmas box when that comes around. You can serve by sponsoring a child through C Compassion International. There's all kinds of ways. But all of us, all of us are called to be servants. I just love hearing about a church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I just read about this last week. And they have just one door uh, coming into their sanctuary. Right? We've got one, two, three, four. We have five doors. They just have one door that leads into their, their sanctuary. And the only way to get in to that sanctuary is through that one door. And guess what they have over the door? A big old sign up. Servants entrance. Servants entrance. Isn't that great? It's a great way to remind everybody that comes into that church as Christ followers, they are all servants, everyone. You know, the greatest and the best person to ever live and walk on this earth was a humble servant, Jesus Christ. And he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for him. And now he calls us to do that same thing. And when we do, guys, we have a huge, huge impact for Christ in the lives of people. Let me share briefly a story about the impact of being a servant. There's a pastor by the name of Dave Stone, and he had an uncle named Uncle Greg. And Uncle Greg had cerebral palsy, and it was a quadriplegic. Dave shares this. My uncle was an incredible inspiration to me. He was one of those guys who had a golden attitude. And he accepted this lot in life and ministered to a whole lot of people in his own way. He was able to get around quite well with an electric wheelchair, but his speech was difficult to understand. A few years ago, he attended a ha handy camp weekend at, con well, week at Country Lake Christian Retreat. One of our church members served as a volunteer that week, and he was assigned to my Uncle Greg. That meant for four solid days, 24 hours a day, he did everything for my Uncle Greg. John fed him every bite. He gave him every drink. He slept on a concrete floor on an air mattress beside Uncle Greg's bed. He took him to the bathroom and cleaned him up. He did everything for four days for Greg. John even got some of his friends together and took my Uncle Greg out to the lake on a flotation device. He swam for the very first time in his life. 
And on the very last day of camp, they call the servant volunteer up onto the platform next to the camper. And they talk about the camper and they recap all the different things they've done during the week. Then they ask them one question. And here's the question. What was the favorite thing you did this week? Well, they always say the same thing, swimming. They were a little concerned that they couldn't be able to understand Uncle Greg because of his difficulty in speaking. So John got up there with Uncle Greg, and he talked about the different things that Greg had done that week. And he said, look, we've nicknamed uh, him the fish because he loves to swim so much. And John then said, okay, Greg, it's your turn now. What was your favorite part of the entire week? No one had any problems understanding my Uncle Greg. Because my Uncle Greg raised his hand up and pointed back at John and said, you. John said, oh, there, there's got to be something else. You know, what, what was it, the swimming? Was it snack time? And Greg raised his hand up again and just said, you. I think Jesus was an Uncle Greg, don't you? And I think that week John put a big old smile on Jesus' face. Guys, we will never know. You will never know the impact you might have when you serve somebody else. You'll never know until we pick up a towel and pick up a basin of water and begin to wash feet as Jesus did. Where do you see a need? Look around in your life, in your community, in your church. Where, where do you see a need? What is it that's kind of stirring around inside of you? What makes you weep when you think about it? What just burns inside of you? What makes you say, why doesn't somebody do something about this? Well, plug in there. Plug in there and make a difference. Ask God, what can I do about this? I may by being a servant of God. It's the very best way to live your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your son Jesus and all that he put up with. Thank you for his patience with the disciples. And Lord, we thank you for your, your patience with us. Because sometimes we want to be at the front of the line and not at the back. Sometimes we want to be first instead of last. Sometimes we want the adulation instead of somebody else. But Lord, God, help us with that. Help us to quit thinking about ourselves and start thinking about you and this magnificent model you set for us. Help every single one of us, Lord, everybody in this room to be a servant of you. And Father, we thank you for the greatest act of service imaginable you coming to this earth and being a ransom for our sins. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who, who doesn't know whether or not uh, they're a believer, who doesn't uh, have a relationship with you, who's not sure if they're in the family of God, if there's anyone here this morning who is really not sure whether or not they're going to go to heaven if they die, oh God, I pray that you'll speak to them. I pray that you'll gently tap them on the shoulder and more that you'd uh, have them open their hearts to you. If there's anyone here, Father, who, who would like to receive you into their life, Lord, just help them just to take a few minutes here and talk to you. Help them to say to you, God, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know my life has been all about me. I know that something's missing, God. I just know it. And Lord, I've heard this morning about a better, better way to live life. So right now, God, I want to let you know that I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe that he was, in fact, 100% God. And I believe that his death on that cross was a ransom for my sins. And he was willing to pay that price. And Father, I just want to say to you, come into my life. I receive you and your son in this free gift of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for coming in. In Jesus' name I pray.
Listen, if you prayed that prayer and God was tapping on your heart and you opened that door, please, 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 I'm begging you. Tear off that little connect card. Check off the box that you've accepted Christ so that we can pray for you. So we can know that another person has stepped across the line of faith and has entered into the... That's big news, guys. That's good stuff. And you need to let your brothers in Christ know about that so we can come alongside and help you in your early stages. Everybody rise for the benediction. This is very especially appropriate for today's sermon. And it's this. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being right where you are. Christ, who indwells you by the power of the Spirit, wants to do something in you. And He, you better believe it, wants to do something through you. Believe this. Go in His grace, in His love, in His power, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.